I now bring the Committee on Governmental Operations out of recess. I'd like to now welcome the Corporation Counsel, Zachary Carter, who heads the Law Department. The New York City Law Department is responsible for all of the legal affairs of the city. It represents the city, the mayor, other elected officials, and the city's many agencies in all affirmative and defensive civil litigation, as well as juvenile delinquency prosecutions brought in family court and administrative code enforcement proceedings brought in criminal court. The Law Department's proposed budget for fiscal year 2016 totals $171.6 million, including $123.6 million to support 1,460 budgeted physicians. Uh, just a, of note, as, as one of the people who is uh, represented by the, the Law Department as a City Council member and the number of times I get threatened with lawsuits uh, on, on a regular basis by various special interests, I remain confident that I have the best legal team in the world to protect me and uh, appreciate some of the uh, protections afforded to elected officials, but um, there is, is a lot of confidence amongst many of us in their abilities to protect us. And uh, perhaps one day we will live in a world where people do not threaten lawsuits as a matter of course, but uh, a, 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 as an attorney, not sure we can do much about that as we graduate more and more law students every year. Uh, during today's hearings, we will discuss many aspects of the department's budget, its operational performance, and how the law department is handling the various judgments and claims against the city, including in the fiscal year 2016 preliminary plan for the law department is a proposal to create a new, new tort division unit to vertically handle certain civil cases brought against the New York Police Department from start to finish rather than moving cases between lawyers at different stages of litigation. The plan also includes actions that would reduce the department's reliance on outside counsel. We are eager to hear details about these and other initiatives. We are also eager to hear about the department's performance and as measured in the preliminary mayor's management report and performance expectations moving forward. Uh, it is our practice to uh, ask for those who plan to testify to take an affirmation. So if you are planning to testify or will need to answer a question on behalf of the corporate counsel, please raise your right hand and if you could affirm to tell the truth before this committee and respond honestly to council member questions and make sure your mics are on. I do. I do. do. Thank you very much and if you could please provide your testimony. Thank you, Chairman uh, Kalos uh, and distinguished members of the Government Operations Committee. Uh, it is a pleasure to come before you to discuss the Law Department's fiscal year uh, 2016 preliminary budget. Uh, first, uh, allow me to introduce my colleagues. Uh, to my right is uh, Fr Jeff Friedlander, who's the first Assistant Corporation Counsel. Uh, to my immediate left is Foster Mills, who's the Managing Attorney for the Law Department. Uh, and on his left is Georgia Pastana, uh, who's the Chief Assistant Corporation Counsel. Over the past year, I've been engaged with the, with the Law Department staff on numerous individual matters with enormous liability, policy, and operational implications for the city and its constituent agencies. Some of these matters involve public safety. Others involve the city's contractual relationships with various service providers. Still others raise important issues concerning access to services. On every occasion, I have never failed to be impressed by the professionalism, hard work, depth of knowledge and expertise, and dedication of our lawyers and the extraordinary staff that supports them. Ultimately, our mission is to vigorously defend the legal interest of the city with an appreciation for the importance of fair outcomes to public confidence in city government. The Corporation Council is the attorney for the city and its agencies and has a responsibility for all litigation and other litig uh, legal matters involving the city. The department employs some 730 attorneys and, six and 630 support staff. Uh, and let me add that of our 730 attorneys, approximately 21% are persons of color and 58% are women. The Law Department consists of 16 legal and three support divisions. We handle an extraordinary array of cases and non-litigation matters, from tort to tax, from environmental and administrative issues to economic development and municipal finance. We also represent the city as plaintiffs in a wide variety of affirmative matters. 
The volume of litigation matters pending against the city presents a substantial challenge. The Torts Division alone defends some 20,000 cases currently pending against the city, its agencies, and employees. Approximately 7,000 cases are filed against the city each year. Approximately 6,000 cases are resolved each year by trial, motion practice, and settlement. The Tort Division secured approximately 1,000 dismissals by motion. While claims for monetary damages present the lion's share of cases pending against the city, substantial resources are devoted to the defense of cases demanding injunctive relief, most often seeking operational reforms of agency practices. Where we determine that such claims are without merit, we oppose them vigorously. However, where a claim brings to the attention, to the city's attention, operational issues in need of correction or reform, we use our resources to assist our agency clients in making necessary operational changes, thereby reducing future liabilities and serving the public more effectively. In addition to defending claims against the city, the Law Department prosecutes claims to advocate the city's fiscal, commercial, and policy interest. Our Affirmative Litigation Division brought aggressive, effective litigation against traffickers of untaxed cigarettes, not only protecting an important revenue stream, but public health. Our appellate division submitted amicus briefs on such topics as marriage equality, immigration, and environmental protection. Our family court division balances the dual goals of serving the best interests of children brought before the court and ensuring community safety. Last year, the division's juvenile delinquency prosecution unit handled approximately 4,600 juvenile delinquency cases. In anticipation of the state legislature's possible passage of uh, the Raise the Age Bill in the next coming weeks, uh, we are already planning the expansion of our delinquency unit to accommodate the added population of 16 and 17-year-old juveniles to family court caseloads. Over the past year, the City Council with our support has produced a host of groundbreaking legislative achievements which have improved the lives of millions of New Yorkers. Together, we have tackled some uh, income inequality um, by developing uh, legislation to extend paid sick leave to half a million more New Yorkers. We assisted the Council's effort to protect the rights of transgender New Yorkers who no longer must prove uh, they had surgery in order to change their sex designation on their birth certificates. We partnered with the Council to protect the rights and well-being of immigrant New Yorkers through the development of the new Municipal ID program and by placing reasonable limits on the city's cooperation with, needles, uh, with needless detentions and deportations. Uh, we look forward to building upon those successes and continuing to support the City Council in the, income, in the uh, efforts in the, incoming, in the coming year, rather. Uh, we look forward to deepening our existing relationships with city agencies. To that end, we've created agency liaison teams uh, within the Law Department to provide more effective, efficient, and proactive service to our city agencies. Uh, with the additional resources we have requested, we will aggressively litigate uh, patently frivolous uh, cases uh, uh, against uh, uh, law enforcement uh, agencies, saving public funds and discouraging litigation. And with that, I and uh, we'll answer any of your questions or deflect them to my colleagues as necessary. As long as I'm not the one on the receiving end, that would be <laughs> amazing. So um, as the eight different agencies have come, uh, have come or will be coming before this committee today, I've been focused on uh, the preliminary mayor's management report. Uh, if you need a copy, we can provide one to you. Do you need one? I don't believe okay. so. You, uh, you've got it. Yeah. Uh, and so, when I, when I used to run companies, we used to focus a lot on goals, and even as I run my own council office, we focus on goal setting. Uh, and so what I noticed is that in terms of for your goal, represent the city of New York in litigation, other legal matters involving city interests limit the city's liability as a result of claims, you actually have no targets. And uh, throughout the rest of the PMMR, there are a number of locations where there are asterisks instead of targets, um, and so I guess the, the quick question there is, would you provide targets for achieving these goals so that we can measure your performance as is met by the PMMR? I think some of the um, targets that have asterisks <coughs> are, are things that uh, we don't think we have enough control over to, uh, to set a target for ourselves. 
Uh, for example, goal 1A, uh, cases commenced against the city and state court. Um, we, yeah, we, can, we, we are certainly trying to bend uh, the arrow there. Uh, putting a target in is, is a little tough. Um, that being said, we're always looking at our targets with the Mayor's Office of Operations, uh, and we will be in discussions with them during the, uh, during the coming months uh, to see if we can uh, you know, figure out if we can put a meaningful number in there uh, that, is, uh, that, that we can uh, be measured against. I, I appreciate that. It's just if the, if the, if the measurements aren't proper, um, then let's pick measurements that do work. But in, in, in no case should we ever be coming before this committee with, or the, the city of New York, because this is published for everyone to see, with uh, targets that are blank and saying, you know what, even though it's a critical indicator, the total cases commenced against the city because we can't predict it or control it, we're not going to use it as an indicator and yet it's still how we're supposed to manage. So um, we need to manage somehow. Uh, along those same lines, um, generally the goal is, especially when we're expanding an agency such as yours with additional funding, where I come from in finance, if somebody asks me for, for more money, I say, okay, well, what are we gonna get for it? What is our return on investment? Uh, throughout here, it seems that goals such as reducing the city caseload in the state courts um, are actually higher than your current practice. So it is easy to claim victory when uh, the casing, cases pending in state court for the uh, past three years have been less than 19,600 um, and your target is 19,600 at any given time. And when your critical indicator for win rate on affirmative motions has been over 70% every single year you've had it, that uh, you set your target at 65%. So could we set more ambitious targets that exceed or meet current performance? Well, we, what we seek to set are realistic targets uh, in an environment that is inherently unpredictable in which there are factors obviously beyond our control because that is the nature of litigation. Uh, and uh, litigation uh, changes uh, the, kind of the, the focus of litigation uh, by advocates, uh, the advocate community, uh, uh, and others uh, change from year to year. So we will uh, try to, because we'll be, I agree with you, we need to have performance goals. There's no, there's no doubt about that. And we uh, would like to set ambitious goals, but we, we want them to be realistic. And, and uh, we're not... Uh, we're not, we're not trying to uh, um, uh, uh, promise uh, small and, and, and achieve high. Uh, that, that's not our, uh, the, the way that we're approaching this. We're, we're just trying to be realistic. So, so my, my big request that you, you fully engage and just make sure that by the time the mayor's management report rolls by, I actually see goals or items no longer there because they, they are not valid measurements. And uh, for, for instance, one example is in fiscal year 13, you had an 85% uh, diversion of juvenile, juveniles that were referred to diversion program with no, do, no delinquency within one year. So that was fiscal year 13 was 85%, fiscal year 14 was 85%, and your four months actuals in FY15 was 84%, but the target is 75%, and I'm hoping that our target would actually be like 99 or 100 percent. I'd love to live in a world where juvenile delinquency, uh, I mean, 85 percent is great. Um, I'd love to live in a world where that is uh, something where kids get in trouble once, but then they go on to have productive lives rather than ending up in the criminal justice system. Right. So um, along those lines, if you could speak to um, how many uh, of juvenile cases are successfully being referred to the, uh, to a diversion program with no new delinquency and um, whether there needs to be support there and what we can do to make sure that fewer kids are being prosecuted and put into the criminal justice system. Do we have the numbers for that? I think we're gonna have to get back to you with the, with the, uh, the raw numbers. I, I spend a lot of time on the women. I'm also on the Women's Issues Committee, and I spend a lot of time dealing with juvenile justice issues. So uh, it is something near and dear to my heart. It is a city where uh, if, you, if you live in some parts of the city, you don't end up with a criminal record by the time you're 18, and if you live in other parts of the city, you do. And um, if you go to university, 
you end up getting community service hours, and if you don't, you end up getting a criminal record, and that is one of the inequities I would love to fix about our world. Um, going on to the to the uh, something that has been a recurring theme for me that I've been bringing up in finance committees and with the, your predecessor who is here from Oath, uh, who I have high regard for. Uh, with regard to ECB outstanding debt, um, by the time I came into office, we discovered that the outstanding debt had uh, had approached and, and achieved $1.5 billion in outstanding debt, although some of that was interest. Uh, ultimately, that is a, a lot of money that went uncollected. Uh, last year, the Law Department reported that uncollected fines for ECB violations referred directly to the Law Department were $76 million. Can you give us an update on outstanding ECB debt collection efforts and what types of outstanding ECB violations are referred to the Law Department? All right. Well, as you, as you noted, uh, the uncollected uh, docketed ECB penalties are approximately uh, $63 million. Uh, and over the past two years, we have been uh, collecting um, uh, th against those docketed penalties at the rate of approximately $8 million uh, a year. And the, department, the, the law department at one point was doing the collections itself. It's now being referred out to outside collection agencies that are, have a actually similar recruitment, uh, recruitment, uh, recoupment uh, rate. Uh, do you think that it would be better for the law department to handle these, continue to, to go back to handling the collections, considering that the outside consult, that the outside contractors and collection agencies aren't doing a better job than the law department was? Well, actually, the law department uh, of these eight million dollars that was referred to, the, the collection agencies uh, mm -hmm. collect about 1.6 million. We collect the uh, the rest of it, so we're doing more uh, of the collection work than the outside collection firms are. I think based on the numbers I was looking at previously, the collection agencies had more cases had been referred out to the collection agencies. They may, they may. I was just talking about what the collection numbers, what the, what the dollars coming in uh, are. But, but your testimony would be that it would actually be better for the city to have the law department doing all the collections versus having collection agencies. I think it, it depends on what needs to be done in order to collect the money. Um, I, I think what we're sending out to the, uh, to the collection agencies is uh, collections that don't require uh, a lawyer to be doing a lot of legal work, um, and the, the, one, the stuff that we're doing uh, requires more oversight by, a, by an attorney to bring the money in. All right, the, the lion's share of the cases referred to the law department uh, for, <coughs> uh, for collections are undocketed penalties, and that require us to actually file claims. These are, uh, these are not uh, claims that uh, only require uh, uh, a, a, a kind of mechanical uh, enforcement. Uh, these are cases that actually have to be uh, litigated uh, to some extent before a judgment can be uh, uh, entered and collected against. To the extent that these are, uh, that this is litigation that must occur based on city laws, I'd be interested in working with the law department to amend the administrative code or charter to uh, allow it for it to be a, a, a de facto uh, judgment that sorry, a, a de facto claim that does not need to go through the court system in order to be uh, attached to, to somebody's property or persons. Oh, we'll be happy to explore that with you. Absolutely, and, and along those same lines, in the preliminary plan, the department's headcount has been increased in an effort to reduce its reliance on outside counsel but by bringing in additional positions in-house. Can you talk about how it was determined that converting consultants into in-house positions would improve operations, and will this result in cost savings for the department? The, um, what you're referring to are 10 heads that we've received uh, in this plan to replace uh, uh, funding for 15 contract attorneys. Um, we hire contract attorneys when we think the work that needs to be done is temporary, um, but it's proven that uh, this is going to be a lot of work for the long term. Uh, and by uh, hiring people uh, on our payroll rather than paying for contract attorneys, um, we can save uh, $600,000 a year, uh, and so we, we did so. Thank you. I like bringing people in and making them our employees. Uh, along those same lines, the Law Department's fiscal year 2016 contract budget totals $26.2 million and accounts for approximately 15.3% of the Department's total operating budget. Can you talk about some of the major contracts that comprise the Department's contract budget 
uh, the process by which the department selects its vendors, and also, quite importantly, what percentage of the department's 405 contractors contracts will be issued to minority and women business enterprises, MWBEs? The contract budget for, well, for us anyway, is uh, split into three general categories, and I'm using the, the nomenclature of the, of the contract budget uh, to, to explain this. Um, one large group is called temporary services, that's where our court reporter contracts are. Uh, there's also um, money in there that we give to the controller every year so that uh, he can hire uh, counsel to perform what are called 50H hearings. Um, that's about four million of it. Um, professional services, legal, is the, is the next group uh, uh, under that rubric in the, in the, uh, the budget. Uh, that is our contract attorneys and paralegals and any outside counsel that we hire. Um, the third large group is called professional services, other, and those are our um, expert witnesses and the other kinds of uh, ex expenses we go through in uh, individual litigations. We use um, a PPB rule uh, method of selecting um, our professional uh, contractors called negotiated acquisition. Um, that can be a uh, rather involved process, as involved as an RFP. It could be somewhat less involved depending upon the circumstance. Um, as for the MWBE, we have so far this year uh, awarded 19 contracts worth uh, $1.6 million uh, to MWBEs. And I don't know what's going to happen between now and, and, and June 30th, obviously, but up till now, that's what we've done. Uh, just because this is a, a very public setting, there, there is a law we were able to pass last year that was actually one of my favorite laws, a law that I worked to try to make happen since 2006, uh, which is open law, which was uh, something, I, a bill uh, that was introduced by Brad Lander and I co-sponsored, which uh, ha has asked uh, the law department to make the law available and online to people in computer readable format and bulk downloadable and so on and so forth. I uh, actually like to thank my uh, counsel, David Seitzer, for his role in uh, drafting that legislation. Um, what is the status of that implementation and contract? We have released the RFP. Uh, it is out uh, for folks to, uh, to answer, um, and uh, we expect uh, responses from the industry, whatever the industry that is, uh, in a couple of weeks. And uh, where can people who are watching this online or over the internet find that RFP so that they can respond to it? Uh, well, we, we, we advertise it Please in the city record. don't tell me it's in the city record. It absolutely is in the city record. That is, that is the best place to put it until we can get the city record online in a more meaningful way. <laughs> Do you know which day and what page of the city record it was in? I did, but I don't recall right at the moment. Uh, for, for those of you watching or in the audience, uh, the city record is the newspaper that is the most essential newspaper. It tells you everything that's happening in the city. It comes out every single day and it gets delivered to elected officials because uh, we're going to read it too. And sometimes they're 40 pages or more. And if you read it every single day for the rest of your life, you will actually find the one article that means something to you over the course of your life. Um, and so we also passed legislation to make sure that it would be online in a way that is computer readable and accessible through an open API. But in addition to the city record, is there anywhere else? I don't, we I don't recall uh, where else we, we may have advertised it. Um, and where can they download a copy of the RFP? I don't think we have one that's downloadable at the moment, um, but I, I suppose we could put one up, but I, I don't recall. I'll have to find out what, uh, what other uh, okay. uh, uh, we used I to advertise it. I, I will add to my list of to do. I, I have a copy of it, so I will be putting the RFP up on my website. I would ask that the would, the, would the law department be kind enough to put a copy of the RFP up on their website? Let me see if we can do that. That would be amazing. Uh, along the same lines of uh, money we're spending on other things, uh, are, are you able to provide a committee, the committee with a breakdown of costs related to various court appointed monitors and special masters that serve the city? And uh, what roles does the law department play in the oversight of the costs of court appointed monitors and special masters? I think every attorney in the room uh, or, or watching can relate to the uh, special master or, or, or monitor who decides that this is how they're going to make the bulk of their income when they don't need to. We, uh, we have special monitors uh, in four cases at the moment. Um, 
and in fiscal 15, the total cost of them all was roughly $2.7 million. Uh, they are uh, in the Vulcan case, which I'm sure you know something about, has to do with the firefighters exam. Uh, the Galeno case, which had to do with the teacher certification exam. Uh, Floyd, which is stop and frisk. And Hanbury, which is a, a, a case having to do with uh, education uh, uh, in the jails by the Department of Education. In an answer to your question about monitoring the monitors uh, effectively. Couscous <laughs> Right. Uh, uh, I, mean, I mean, basically, it, you, you have to do two things. I mean, you, you do want it to uh, monitor uh, the, the activity of the, uh, of the lead monitors in these uh, cases who are in, enforcing compliance with uh, decrees and the persons that they employ uh, to assist them. Uh, but in my experience, the best way to reduce the cost of a monitorship is to manage the compliance of your client agency. Uh, if you can do that, you can take a lot of the cost out of the, out of the, uh, the monitorship process. Uh, can you elaborate? That, that's amazing to hear. Can you elaborate on some of the management that the uh, law department is involved in in managing the agencies so that they do not incur additional costs? Well, certainly, I mean, that, but to the extent that, that, uh, that there are um, uh, decrees affecting uh, the police department, for instance, in, in, in Floyd, uh, to the extent that the, that the law department works cooperatively with the, with the police department uh, and with the monitor to make sure that uh, we come to uh, some uh, prompt agreement uh, on uh, what uh, uh, operational um, uh, reforms are necessary, what operational uh, procedures have to be um, uh, put in place. Uh, we do that in a way uh, that does not require uh, more effort on the part of the monitor and the monitor's um, uh, uh, associates or agents uh, than is necessary. Uh, could you give us an exact breakdown for each monitor or uh, special master uh, in, by follow-up? Thank you. Uh, and then just a step back to the open law RFP. Will the uh, law department be giving any preference to free Libre and open source software code so that you actually own the code? You can remove the vendor, replace the vendor, take the code in-house, and not have to continue paying for some uh, a method of hosting it. The uh, RFP does not get into those kind of details. What it gets into is what it is from the user's point of view we want to see. How you do that is up to you. You can propose any way you, to do that you like. Would, would the department be uh, open to doing a, a life cycle analysis or cost benefit analysis with whatever the finalists are to make sure that you're properly accounting for the value of not being locked into a vendor for the rest of as long as you are complying with the law? One of the, one of the things we, we do when we select uh, contractors is to figure such things out. Uh, if, if there is a uh, contractor or a proposed contractor who wants to point out to us uh, that they have a better uh, mousetrap, uh, we're, we're, we're certainly uh, happy to, to see that. Thank you. Uh, last year, New York State received $3.25 billion from a settlement with BNP Paribas, which pled guilty to violating sanctions against Iran. New York City is due to receive $447 million of that settlement. The funding is to be redirected towards uh, reducing crime. What role will the department play in determining how this funding will be used? The uh the department uh, 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 is not uh, taking the lead uh, in uh, determining that. I believe that would be um, uh, the, the uh, uh, in the ambit of um, the mayor's office in cr on criminal justice, uh, coordinating with the um, uh, elected district attorneys uh, responsible for. Uh, the uh, the forfeiture of those uh, of those of, of those proceeds and with the attorney general. The preliminary plan for the law department includes 3.2 million dollars in baseline funding to create a new tort division unit that would vertically handle cases 
Uh, certain civil cases brought against the police department from start to finish. Um, do you anticipate that this unit will ultimately pay for itself by reducing frivolous litigation? And uh, other than increasing the number of lawyers assigned to handle these cases, what other efforts have you taken in order to reduce the number of civil rights cases filed against the NYPD? And along those same lines, following local law 71 of 2013, uh, aimed at strengthening the city's ban on bias-based profiling, especially stop and frisk. Uh, have we seen an uptake in uh, cases being brought under that? Okay, let me start with, uh, with uh, your, your question in connection with the tort division uh, first. Uh, you, know, you referred to a unit. We, we like to refer to it as an initiative. But, and the reason why uh, and the, the difference is important is that obviously we defend cases filed in five boroughs, uh, and consequently, while we it, you can think of it as a as a unit in concept, it's actually an initiative uh, in which we are concentrating uh, resources, redeploying resources to focus on um, cases alleging intentional misconduct by law enforcement officers across the boroughs. What we'd like to do uh, is to uh, provide. Uh, to increase the amount of vertical handling of these cases at critical stages, uh, identifying those cases that um, are uh, th that should be handled vertically, and trying to devote uh, both attorney uh, and support resources to uh, improving uh, the uh, 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 case initial case reviews, um, the investigation of the uh, factual claims of those cases. Uh, the research uh, that will support motion practice, because while we talk a lot about the disposition of cases by trial and settlement, an extremely important and not uh, talked about enough uh, method of disposing of cases is by dispositive motion, that is motions to uh, dismiss. I mean, out of the uh, 7,000 uh, cases that were disposed of last year, 1,000 uh, were disposed of uh, by uh, dispositive motion, motions to dismiss. And as you pointed out earlier, I mean, our, our uh, rate of, uh, our win rate uh, in those cases and motions brought is around 78%. We would like to increase um, substantially the number of motions that are brought in those cases uh, because we believe that in, uh, if we select those cases carefully and if we have the opportunity to prepare and research those cases uh, uh, better, uh, that, that that win rate should hold across a larger number of, uh, of motions uh, brought. Uh, we are also uh, um, uh, improving our communications with the police department so that we get uh, a earlier production of records that are required for us to evaluate uh, the claims that are brought against the, uh, the, uh, the New York City Police Department and its and its individual officers. The sooner we can uh, get uh, uh, the documentary evidence and, uh, and, and any uh, other evidence in, uh, that will help us to defend these claims, the sooner we can make a, reason, a reasoned and well-informed assessment uh, about, the, uh, about the merits of, of these claims and, and make decisions about where we'll focus our our resources in order to get uh, better results and, al and also discourage uh, the filing of, uh, of frivolous claims. And uh, the, the last piece with regard to Local Law 71. Uh, local Law 71 is, is, uh, is, is, is an interesting question uh, and, uh, and, and uh, I think that the impact has not been by way of an increase in claims uh, but by, a, by, by surprisingly few claims. Uh, we've only had one. Uh, and I think the reason for that is that the police department, in response uh, to these laws, uh, focused a great deal of training um, around uh, police officer compliance. Um, and of, of course, uh, in, uh, th this comes at a time when uh, the uh, volume of stops that inspired uh, the profiling law in the first place has been reduced uh, from something over 700,000 uh, to fewer than 50,000 uh, a year. So the reduction in stops plus the training 
uh, around the uh, the profiling laws, I think has uh, resulted in a in a uh, um, a marked decrease um, in in the encounters that result in complaints. I, I'll be honest. I was I'm a big I, I, I was a supporter of the end to uh, of stop and frisk, and so I was almost afraid to ask the question. But your answer is amazing. Uh, that everything people warned about didn't actually happen, and uh, that that is refreshing to hear, and it is amazing work by your department, the NYPD, and our administration, and uh, move, moving the ball for, forward and uh, fixing what had become uh, an inequity in our society. Uh, with regard to that one case, it, who is providing the, per, the defense for the is the NYPD officer being sued in their individual capacity, and who is providing them with? A I, I really I don't have the information in connection with the with that single case. If if, if we could pass that along, we, I would just um, I, I for us, we're attorneys. Lawsuits don't phase us. For many folks, uh, you get sued, and now you have to hire somebody for an answer. Well, answers cost fifty thousand dollars or more, and who has fifty thousand dollars unless you're taking out a a house, uh, luckily, maybe you're lucky enough that you can take a mortgage out on a house, maybe you're lucky enough to actually own a house in this city, which is rare. Um, and even if you're innocent, the cost of defense uh, in a civil action where you aren't afforded an attorney, uh, especially for city employees that don't earn as much as others, uh, is a concern for me. Um, with regard to the uh, judgment and claims, uh, in fiscal year 2014, the city's uh, payouts increased significantly compared to prior years to a total of 732 uh, million. Uh, what were some of the major cases that were settled? Uh, do you expect the city's judgment claims payout will be lower this year now that some of the bigger cases have been settled? Uh, and how does the city settlement rate an average payout compared to other large cities? And uh, what are you doing to reduce our city's liability in those cases? Uh, among the, the larger um Settlements uh, of, of note uh, would have been the uh, Re Republican National uh, Convention case. That was approximately $18 million. Uh, the um, uh, FDNY employment discrimination case that was settled uh, for $99 million. Uh, and the Central Park Jogger case that was settled for uh, approximately $41 uh, million. Uh, with respect to uh, the future, um, that's difficult to gauge because, as you know, in any one fiscal year, cases may be settled that were brought as far back as the as the uh, as the uh, mid 1990s, uh, and so because the the pace of litigation varies from uh, from cause from from case to case, uh, we will we, it's not always within our control and not always uh, uh, easily ascertainable which cases. Uh, will uh, will settle because the dynamics are, are different. One of the things that has changed uh, that is uh, new and that makes uh, 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 estimating uh, uh, the the number of judgments even more uh, unpredictable is the fact that uh, DA's offices, uh, you know, frankly, to their credit, uh, have developed uh, conviction integrity units. Uh, that are uh, receiving uh, complaints of wrongful conviction and uh, appear to be earnestly reinvestigating cases. And as you know, uh, and it's been widely publicized, there has been an upsurge in cases in which DA's offices um, have um, acquiesced in, uh, in um, uh, motions to uh, vacate convictions because, or actually brought them themselves on their own uh, motion. Uh, where their investigations have determined that uh, some person who has been convicted uh, uh, was, uh, was actually innocent. Uh, those uh, 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 vacated convictions will certainly uh, result in claims, and those claims will, uh, are, are, uh, are increasing. Uh, and what the, uh, the numbers will be in the near term are very difficult to calculate at this point. So one follow-up question on just judgment and claims. Uh, the PMMR uh, for fiscal year 14 has 579 uh, million, uh, 899,000. Uh, and the question that I asked, I cited the, uh, the 732 million 
Um, so FMS and, and the controller are, are going with the 700 million. The, so can you help us explain the discrepancy in the total citywide payout for judgment and claims and why the PMMR might be uh, different than what we are well, getting? The, the PMMR is our number and the 732 is the controller RMB number. I don't know why they're different. Um, there may be things in the larger number that we have nothing to do with. Um, for example, controller settlements before things become lawsuits. I, I don't know. Um, and the 732 number is something you really have to find out from OMB, uh, how they get that. Okay. Uh, we're, we're, we're one, you know, do you know one large part of, a, of, of that number, but not the entirety of it. So the 200 million relates to what kind of cases? Don't know. I don't know. The, 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 I mean, the, the difference between the 732 and the 579? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. So, um, to the extent that there's $200 million that are, can't really be explained, if uh, you could agree to work with our finance division and the controller to figure out why there's that discrepancy. Uh, and, and then with regard to clarification, um, on the uh, tort division initiative, uh, to be clear, the pr how are you determining the proper budget for the initiative? And I think the specific question is, will this, in will this initiative pay for itself uh, in terms of the, the cost savings? Uh, and if it is intended to pay for itself, should it be bigger? Uh, and if not, what is its ultimate purpose? And in other words, how to decide what would be appropriate for this unit and how will you measure its success? Sure. Uh, uh, based on our experience with the uh, Bronx Police uh, Unit, with which you are, are probably uh, familiar, there was a year-over-year uh, -year reduction in cases filed of 200 uh, that uh, we, we estimate uh, may, uh, would have uh, uh, given rise uh, to when you just uh, uh, make a, a, a calculation based on, on, uh, on, on historical um, um, settlements of approximately $7.8 million. Uh, that's real money, and that, that clearly uh, 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 rendered the, uh, the Bronx Police Unit um, kind of self-financing in terms of, of, uh, of paying for itself. Uh, we uh, expect a similar result with the investment of additional resources in uh, this uh, 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 tort uh, initiative uh, focused on cases brought against uh, uh, members of, of, uh, of law enforcement agencies. Uh, the number you cited for the Bronx Police Unit was 7.8 million? I believe that's the, I believe that's the figure. Oh, 7.5, I'm Seven, correct. So 7.5, but the, uh, the new tor tort, sorry, the tort division initiative is only funded at 3.2. Uh, is that because for the other four boroughs, they don't see the same volume as the Bronx? Is this really just an experience? It sounds like it's an experience. The, the 3.2 is simply the, the calculation of the cost of 30 attorneys and 10 support staff. And, and how without, many? Without new, without new real estate or anything else. So, so how, what, is, what is the budget for the Bronx Police Unit? And if you can actually give us an update regarding the performance. Well, I think you've already shared the performance, but what is, how many positions are funded on the Bronx Police we, Unit? We'll, we'll get that to you. Right. And just to the extent that we're extrapolating that to the other four boroughs, uh, that would be interesting to see. Um, I want to, at this point, just uh, thank you for your exhaustive answers to so many of our questions and for all the great work that you do uh, defending our city and uh, settling cases when our city has done something wrong and just making sure that as we move forward, we're moving forward in a city that is more just. Uh, I particularly am impressed by the fact that you are working with our agencies internally in order to make sure that they are voluntarily or perhaps not voluntarily, but at your uh, demand uh, complying with our court orders and uh, reducing course costs with our court monitors and special masters. And um, thank you for all of your hard work. Well, it's thank you for your job. And it's it. good to have the best law force there is and the biggest law firm in the world right here in our city. Uh, thank you very much. We're going to take a. Um,
10 minute recess and uh, then we will hear from the Department of Citywide Administrative Services.